Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Marco, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. Before I get started today, I just want to remind everyone to click that subscribe button wherever you're listening. That way you never miss an episode. Also, be sure to follow me on social media. The place where I interact the most is Instagram, and you can find me there at Military Murder Podcast. I often give reminders of upcoming episodes, and I've been posting a lot of short true crime stories. Also, follow me on TikTok. There, you can find me at Military Margo with a T at the end. I love TikTok as a platform, but if you only follow me on TikTok, you may need to follow me on Instagram as a backup, just in case my account gets frozen. And listen, if you know, you know. Okay. Let's get to today's story. Today's story is going to leave you baffled. Everyone tends to feel safer on military installations. Heck, I'm guilty of this. Even with two years of military true crime telling and a decade of working behind the scenes in legal under my belt, I still feel safe on base. But this story may give you pause. Today's story intersects with an issue many of us don't like to think about, homeless veterans. According to a pre-pandemic January 2020 Department of Housing and Urban Development survey, the amount of veterans without a home increased in 2020, and that was before the pandemic. According to reporting by Leo Shane with Military Times, veterans make up 6% of the U.S. population, but they make up 8% of the homeless population. Breaking this down even further, it means that for every 10,000 veterans in America, 21 of those veterans are homeless. Now throw in the pandemic and the numbers are even worse. But what does any of this have to do with today's case? Well, you'll have to wait and see. Join me today as I tell you the story of the kidnapping of Ashanti Billy from Little Creek in Virginia. Now let's dig in. This story was researched and written by Myrtle. The sources for this episode include a criminal complaint, three court opinions, online news stations, Pilot Online, WUSA 9, WTOP, WCNC, Wavy 10, 13 News Now, and WY Daily. It also includes the Law Code of Virginia and the Department of Justice website. The story opens up in Charlotte, North Carolina. On September 29, 2017, a landscaper at the East Stonewall AME Zion Church smelled something while he was working in the back of the building. As he looked around for the source of the smell, he spotted something in tall grass near some boulders along the fence, but he couldn't quite figure out what it was. Thinking it might be, I don't know, like a dead deer, he got his foreman and together they went to check it out. As they pulled the tall grass back, they realized it was the partially nude, decomposing body of a young woman. They immediately called 911. In an interview with News 13 in Charlotte, The leader of the AME Zion Church, Reverend Michael McLean, he said there is a lot of crime in that area and different things have turned up behind the church like drug paraphernalia and discarded clothing, but never a dead body. The victim in this case was a female. Her body was laying on some plastic sheeting on its back with the legs spread open. Her arms were above her head, twisted up inside a dark colored sweatshirt and shirt but her sports bra and socks were still on. Her skin had begun to mummify and the skeleton was visible in places. There were no pants on or around the body and there was a plastic glove and a pair of underwear found on the ground near the victim's head. Police and fire show up and then the FBI shows up. Soon the detectives got word that a 19-year-old girl who met the description of their victim had been missing since September 18th. That was a whopping 11 days earlier. But she had been missing in Norfolk, Virginia, roughly 300 miles away. Could it be? 
That seems like an awfully long way to dump a body if this really was the girl missing from Virginia. Sadly, the next afternoon, the FBI confirmed that the body found behind the church in Charlotte was in fact the missing 19-year-old Ashanti Billy. Ashanti had vanished after she was supposed to open a sandwich shop on post at Little Creek, a Navy base in Norfolk. For 11 whole days, she had been the subject of a massive search back in Virginia. Her parents, Mel Tony and Brandy Billy, who lived in Maryland, were notified of the worst possible outcome of Ashanti's disappearance. Brandy Billy, Ashanti's mother, later told WUSA 9 News, quote, I still feel numb. I feel like it's a nightmare and I just keep going to sleep and waking up to the same nightmare over and over again. We have to bring this person or persons to justice so this doesn't happen to anyone else. We also still need to face the fact she was abducted from a military installation, somewhere we thought would be a safe location, end quote. Ashanti's father, Mel Tony, said that he cries often when he thinks of his daughter and said, quote, now I don't have the opportunity to walk her down the aisle as a father on her wedding day. Hugs are lessened because I don't get the chance to hug grandkids. There's a lot of subtraction in my life because of this, end quote. The FBI dug in to solve the mystery of what happened to Ashanti. Ashanti's body was sent to the Mecklenburg County Medical Examiner's Office in Charlotte, where an autopsy was performed. Ashanti's identification was confirmed through dental records and through a rose tattoo on her thigh that was compared with a photograph. While her body was categorized as partially skeletized, they were able to take swabs of the remaining skin, teeth, and fingernails for DNA. And they took samples of her hair for analyzing. Some of her teeth that were recovered were not in their sockets, but the medical examiner determined that they were most likely dislodged during the recovery. She had broken fingernails and there was some kind of something under her nails. Ashanti's postmortem drug and alcohol screening eventually came back negative. The medical examiner, Dr. Jonathan Privet, concluded the autopsy report with the following statement, quote, based on the history and autopsy findings, it is my opinion that the cause of death in this case is undetermined trauma, end quote. What? What does that even mean? How, how did we get here? How could a young woman go missing in Virginia, wind up dead five hours away, and now her cause of death is undetermined? Well, detectives grow through this a lot. So let's discuss this case just as they would. Let's backtrack and put this puzzle together. Ashanti Billy was new in town. She had recently moved to Virginia Beach from Maryland the month before in August of 2017. She moved to Virginia to study culinary arts at the Art Institute of Virginia Beach. Her life goal was to one day open her own bakery. Early on Monday, September 18th, 2017, 19-year-old Ashanti Billy, she woke up and got ready for work. She threw on a black work shirt, black zip-up hoodie, and dark colored pants. She grabbed her stuff and she left her Virginia Beach apartment. She drove her cream-colored 2014 Mini Cooper, heading for the Blimpy Sub Shop on Joint Expeditionary Base, Little Creek. That day, Ashanti was scheduled to go in three hours earlier than normal because she was supposed to do a deep clean of the restaurant in preparation for a health inspection that was scheduled later that afternoon. Security cameras at Little Creek's gate number three caught Ashanti's car entering at 4.44 in the morning. But Ashanti had to turn around almost as soon as she got through the gate because womp womp, there was a car accident just inside the gate blocking the road. Her car was seen exiting gate three just two minutes later at 4.46 a.m. Then 12 minutes later, it was seen on camera again, this time entering the base at gate one. The CCTV footage was not super clear as to who was actually driving, but the driver was seen wearing dark colored clothing. Another camera showed her car circling the blimpy at five in the morning. But then at 5.33 a.m., Ashanti's Mini Cooper was seen again on gate one's camera, except this time it was exiting the base and the driver was a male wearing light colored clothing. No one else was visible in the car but the driver. Later that morning at around 8 a.m., Andrew Estrada, one of Ashanti's co-workers, arrived at Blimpy and he found the building completely dark. No one was there. 
He knew that Ashanti was scheduled to open and he knew that she was extremely reliable and never late. You see, Ashanti's a military brat, which is a term of endearment because both of her parents were army. So Ashanti was taught from a young age to be punctual. Andrew was worried, so he called Ashanti's cell phone. And after it rang a few times, a man's voice answered. The man told Andrew that he found this phone in a construction dumpster in a parking lot. It was in perfect condition and the phone was fully charged. The man found it and he thought it was very strange that someone would throw away a perfectly good cell phone. So he held on to it, hoping that the owner would call so he could get it back to them. Andrew immediately knew that something was very wrong. So he called the police. The police promptly went to retrieve Ashanti's phone from this man. But by this point, Ashanti was still not reported missing. It wasn't until later that day when Ashanti failed to arrive at her class at the Art Institute that she was formally reported missing. The police put out a public bolo or be on the lookout for Ashanti's car. And it was six whole days where it appeared that Ashanti and her car just vanished. But on Saturday, September 23rd, they found the Mini Cooper in the Ocean View section of Norfolk, which is about six miles from the base. According to the Virginian pilot, a resident named Greg Castellanos said he noticed the car on Monday the 18th. It was parked away from the curb with the windows rolled halfway down, the doors unlocked, and the key fob was laying on the passenger seat. He said he figured at the time that the car belonged to someone visiting a neighbor and didn't report it. So police immediately, they get access to this car. And inside the rear compartment of the car, police found Ashanti's pants. They also find one of her shoes, which was inside a pant leg, kind of like how they'd be if you took off your pants with your shoes still on. There was dirt and debris inside the pants that would be consistent with them being taken off while outside and on the ground. The undercarriage of the car had dirt and plant debris. It looked like it had been driven off road. When the crime scene technicians processed the car for prints, they found only one partial print, nothing else, most likely from someone wiping down the car. With no more leads on where Ashanti was or could be or who may have been involved in her disappearance, the FBI took over as lead investigators on Monday, September 25th, one week after Ashanti went missing. And in an attempt to get more leads, a $10,000 reward was offered for information about her disappearance. On Wednesday, September 27th, Blimpy matched the FBI's reward money, raising it to $20,000. On Thursday, a citizen search party went out to the area near the dumpster where Ashanti's cell phone had been found back on the 18th. The volunteers found a piece of clothing and hair braids that appeared to be dyed red. Ashanti's driver's license showed her hair in braids and some of them were, in fact, dyed red. The FBI interviewed Ashanti's co-workers from Blimpy to see if they knew of anyone that was coming to see Ashanti at work. Well, you know, she did have a boyfriend, but he was at Army boot camp in South Carolina when she went missing. But her co-workers did say there was a guy, a guy that hung out at the restaurant daily. He had been a day laborer when the Blimpy was being built over the summer of 2017, but he was still coming around all the time. The man's name was Eric Brian Brown. Another thing the co-workers mentioned was that Blimpy was near a laundromat and this brown guy was there so often they thought he worked there, but he didn't. They also said that Eric Brown gave them major creep vibes because he would make sexual advances and say completely lewd things to Ashanti about her body. He was like attempting to flirt with her while she was working. One coworker specifically remembered him saying something directly to Ashanti about her, quote, big ass, end quote. And another said that Brown told them that he thought, quote, the bands would make her dance, end quote, in reference to Ashanti. Now, in rapper Juicy J's song, Bands Make Her Dance, it's used as a slang for paying strippers. So basically, when Brown said this, he was implying that Ashanti would dance for money. Hence, bands or money bands. <laughs> Whatever. People say the weirdest things. Well, armed with this new information, the FBI started to check into Eric Brian Brown to see what they could dig up. According to the criminal complaint, a confidential witness told them that Eric, quote, hated black women because they were all gold diggers 
and hypnotized by social media, and they only want guys with all the money, end quote. Brown had told this confidential witness that, quote, black women are always buying hair and wigs and dyeing their hair, end quote. First of all, what is wrong with people? Second of all, Eric Brown was black himself. And third of all, if he hated black women so much, why was he always flirting with Ashanti, a beautiful young black woman? Also, women of all races buy hair. Hello, extensions. And women dyeing hair? Seriously, show me a woman over 30 who has never dyed their hair. And listen, hydrogen peroxide and sun in do count as hair dye. And if you show me someone, I'll show you a liar. (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Some of y'all are probably about to reach through your podcast and slap me, but don't. So Eric's co-workers from the construction company that built Blimpy told investigators that Eric would ask for rides, quote, home, end quote. But he would always want to be dropped off in some random parking lot. And they never actually took him to a house or an apartment. Oddly, they knew that he didn't have a car. But when they would get to the work site, he was already there. He was next to the laundromat waiting for them to come in. Curiously, though, since September 18th, the day that Ashanti disappeared, no one from Blimpy or his construction co-workers had seen Eric Brown hanging out around the Blimpy or any of the other nearby businesses where he was seen daily. You might be asking yourself why Eric Brown was on post anyway. Brown, well, he had access to Little Creek because he was actually a retired Navy petty officer. He had served over 21 years as an information systems technician, or IT, as they're known in the Navy. ITs specialize in computer network and communications technology. Brown's DD-214 showed his home of record as Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, a DD-214 for my non-military listeners is a certificate of release or discharge from active duty. And a DD-214 is basically a veteran's proof that they served in the military. On the form, there is a place for a home of record. And as I just mentioned, his home of record was in Charlotte, North Carolina. Wait, hmm, that's super interesting because that's the city where they found Ashanti's body. Is it a coincidence that he has connections to that area? Well, hang on, because it gets pretty weird. The exact address that Eric Brown had listed as his home of record was 1517 Crawford Drive in Charlotte. That house is only about 300 yards away from the AME Zion Church where Ashanti Billy's body was found. Whoa! Investigators can feel they are onto something, so they keep digging. Investigators found out that Eric had a brother, but they hadn't talked in over three years after the family home was foreclosed on. And get this. Eric's brother told investigators that they attended AME Zion Church Vacation Bible School as children. It was his freaking church, y'all. Even though the family had lost the house, there was still mail for Eric Brown that was coming to that address dated in September of 2017. But even with all of this information, they still don't have enough. So the police and FBI asked the public for help. And on October 27th, they got a tip. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like, and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are, because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. 
At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. HBO Max presents Love and Death. It is human nature to take risks. Would you be interested in having an affair? Starring Elizabeth Olsen and Jesse Plemons. You need to be careful. Betty Gore was murdered by someone she knew. The new Max original limited series, Love and Death, premiering April 27th on HBO Max. The truth has a way of coming out. Listen to the official Love and Death podcast wherever you get your podcasts. On October 27th, a man sent in video surveillance from his house, which was near the dumpster where Ashanti's cell phone was found. In the video, you can see a cream-colored Mini Cooper pull up and park. Then the driver exits the vehicle, walks over to the dumpster, and tosses the phone in. The police asked the public to look closely at the video and see if anything about the person looked familiar to them. The man in the video had a very distinct walk that they thought would make him identifiable. A couple of days after releasing the video, they got a call from a construction worker who said the person in the video was very familiar. He recognized the way the person walked and he thought that the light-colored clothing that the person was wearing were clothes that he had given to a co-worker before. A co-worker named, you guessed it, Eric Brian Brown. The investigators requested copies of the base entry logs and found that Eric Brown had in fact entered Little Creek through Gate 1 on September 14th. They pulled the security footage from the gate from that day and verified that Brown did actually come through the gate. They were unable to find any evidence that Brown ever left the base, but he was listed on the entry log re-entering Gate 1 on the afternoon of September 19th, the day after Ashanti went missing. So just FYI, on military bases, you have to show your military identification to get on post, but you don't have to show identification when you're exiting. So that's why there's no record of him leaving. They checked Brown's financial and cell phone records next, and he used his cell phone almost every day for the entire month of September. But there was no data usage on his cell phone on September 18th. None, not a zilch, which, if you remember, is when Ashanti went missing. Investigators are able to see that Brown's phone was used on post from September 14th through the evening of September 17th, and he did some online shopping on the 16th around 4 p.m., and again on the 17th around the same time. But then that's when his phone goes radio silent. Both of the online purchases were tracked to an IP address from within the base at Little Creek. And the web activity after Ashanti's disappearance is interesting to say the least. On the 19th, his web activity included searches like, quote, police looking for man, end quote, and, quote, Norfolk police looking for man in connection with homicide, end quote. Other online searches included, quote, Amber Alert, September 2017, Missing Woman and Baby, and Missing Woman and Man, end quote. He did a little web browsing again on the 21st, looking for information on Charlotte, North Carolina news sites. And mind you, it would still be eight days before Ashanti's body would be found. Then on the 22nd, He searched for, quote, J.E.B. Little Creek Blimpies, end quote, and also searched for stuff about parents of a missing college student. On September 27th, law enforcement started surveilling Brown at Norfolk Naval Base. The entire day and night of the 27th into the 28th, Eric Brown was curled up in a chair in front of a TV in the base gym's TV room. When he wasn't sleeping, he watched hours and hours of TV. He finally got up in the afternoon and left the TV room. He went to the locker room, showered and changed his clothes, and then he left, carrying a backpack. 
Brown started wandering around aimlessly, walking randomly between buildings with no real path or purpose. Along the way, he would try to open car doors and was waving down vehicles as they passed. He eventually made his way to a 24-hour laundromat on Norfolk and went to sleep. He woke up and left only to start wandering around the base again. It was now the 29th and Brown had made it to Virginia Beach, where he was at a Hardy's restaurant. Apparently, the surveillance team wasn't as low-key as they thought because Brown went right up to the car surveilling him and confronted one of the cops. Then he went inside and stayed for a few hours until he finally left and went to another laundromat. I I don't know. I guess this guy really likes laundromats. Around 7.45 p.m. the night of the 29th, Eric Brown walked into a McDonald's down the street from the Hardee's and laundromat. And while he was there, he met a woman who the police knew had a record and she happened to be a sex worker. This woman later gives a statement to the investigators. So what happened next is from her account. They went to an Econo Lodge where the woman had a room and Brown asked her for a quote date, which basically means he wanted to pay her to have sex with him. She wanted to know if he had any money or condoms and he must not have had any because she sent him off to the store with a shopping list. The shopping list included cigarettes, cash, and condoms. The surveillance team watched him leave the motel and go to a gas station where he bought these cigarettes. He went back to the motel room where the woman realized he didn't have any money on him when he got back, so she sent him right out the door. He found an ATM and made a withdrawal and then headed back to the room. But by the time he got there, his plans for a date were dashed when he got back and she told him some family had showed up and they couldn't use her room. Brown had a bag with him and he asked her if he could leave it there. She said he could because she figured he was just going to get another room in the motel where they could, you know, have their date. Well, Brown didn't do that. He headed back out walking around aimlessly in the same area where he had been all day. He got through some woods and some private property and officers were still hanging back, just watching what he was doing. At around 4.15 in the morning, he started walking up and down the on and off ramps of the freeway. And by this point, the cops had had enough and they deemed this a safety hazard. So they detained him for trespassing. When the officers caught up with Brown, he clammed up and wouldn't say a word. And according to the arrest officer, his skin was icy cold to the touch. The officer called for an ambulance. And while they waited, they searched him and found his wallet that had his ID in it. They had to use that to identify him since he was refusing to say anything. He had a few more things on his person that the cops documented, along with his ID, of course. He had $60 in cash, some credit cards, and some customer loyalty cards, and these were all in his wallet. In his pockets, they found some keys, a cell phone, an unused condom, and, well, listen, folks, you know, I just report what I find when I research it. They also found a used condom. Now. Really, police officers go through so much. I would have hated to be the cop who had to frisk this guy. So they took him to the Norfolk City Jail for processing and they started asking him the standard booking questions. The first question was, what is your place of birth? Well, by this point, Brown must have decided to start talking again because he blurts out Charlotte, North Carolina. But he didn't stop there. He added that he goes back and forth from time to time. And when they ask him his home address, He gave them an address in Norfolk, Virginia, but they were unable to link him to that address. In fact, they were unable to link Brown to any address in any law enforcement database. They reasoned that he must be homeless and lives in random buildings both on and off Norfolk and Little Creek bases. They discovered that he had his possessions locked up in multiple lockers that they found on and off base. Not illegal by any means, And listen, he had proper access to the base because of his retirement status. But he did participate in illegal activity on this particular day. And that was just what the police needed to arrest him and keep him in jail. They were able to arrest him on charges of solicitation of prostitution and frequenting a bounty place. Um, what the heck is that? It sounds like something from like the 1800s. Well, according to the Virginia Criminal Code, it is illegal for any person to keep any bounty place or to reside in or at or visit for immoral purposes 
any such bounty place. Now, listen, I read that and I am still confused. But the law goes on to actually define a bounty place as any place within or outside any building or structure that is used or is to be used for lewdness, assignation, or prostitution. So it's an old Virginia law, but can still be used to charge someone, and it's considered a class one misdemeanor. Brown was held at the Virginia Beach jail pending bond, but no bond was posted, so he stayed locked up. While he was in the jail, he had a conversation with another inmate, who then told the authorities what Brown said. This jailhouse inmate, I guess you can say, had said something to Brown about having a problem with a female witness who had turned him into the police. And Brown ominously told him, quote, someone should pay her a visit, end quote. He made several other violent references in his conversation with the inmate, but then he said something that really made his cellmate's blood run cold. Brown told him, quote, there ain't nothing like the first taste of blood. Sometimes it makes you do things that are unexplainable, end quote. And not just that, but he polished off this creepy conversation by saying he had done some serious stuff. Eric Brown was interviewed in depth while he was being held at the Virginia Beach City Jail. Of course, they Mirandized him, but he decided to waive his right to counsel and he agreed to talk to the investigators. They questioned if he had seen or heard anything that happened at the base on September 18th. And he told them he had not, but remembered seeing a news report about a, quote, disappeared girl, end quote, while he was at the laundromat. They asked him if he knew who Ashanti Billy was, but he acted surprised and said something like, quote, that's the girl's name, end quote. Kind of like he didn't know who she was until they said her name. Yeah, okay. So he was interviewed again a couple weeks later, Mirandized again, and he turned down counsel again. He agreed to talk to investigators again, and they began by asking him what his activities were on the day of September 18th, 2017. Brown told them that he walked from gate five to gate three on that night, but it was at this point where he blacked out as soon as he got close to gate three and didn't remember anything he did for several days after that. The FBI agents asked him specifically about the abduction and murder of Ashanti Billy, but Brown just keeps singing the same old song that he couldn't remember, so he couldn't say if he had anything to do with her or not. Coincidentally, the road that runs from gate five to gate three keeps going and ends near gate one, which is closest to the blimpy where Ashanti disappeared. It's safe to say that their interview with Brown was odd. So Ashanti's body and clothes were eventually processed for evidence that included DNA swabs. And on November 2nd, the results came back on a report from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Crime Lab. The zip up hoodie and shirt that she had on her body when it was found had an unknown male DNA profile identified on them. Brown's DNA was taken and compared with the DNA found on Ashanti's clothes. The two samples were a match. And you want to know how certain the lab was that the DNA on Ashanti's hoodie belonged to Brown? They said the probability of that DNA belonging to anyone besides Eric Brown were 1 in 2.7 quadrillion. I don't even know how many zeros it takes to write a quadrillion, but I know it's a lot. Okay, okay. I know everyone's going to want to know. So I looked it up and a quadrillion has 50. Teen zeros. Now, the DNA match on the shirt didn't get the same level of certainty as the first item. This one was only given a probability of 1 in 720 billion. But listen, I think it's safe to say that the FBI got their man. Eric Brian Brown was formally charged for the horrible crimes against Ashanti Billy on November 7, 2017. The charges against him included stalking, assault, including assault with intent to commit aggravated sexual abuse and sexual abuse, theft, and kidnapping resulting in death. Before the trial could even get underway, Brown was ordered to complete a mental health evaluation to determine if he was even competent to stand trial. According to Wavy 10 News, the evaluation was ordered due to his erratic behavior 
and some, quote, deeply troubling statements, end quote, made to FBI agents. In addition to these statements, the prison documented some, quote, unusual actions, end quote, by Brown. And according to a court opinion, Brown actually attempted suicide while in federal pretrial confinement. During the mental health evaluation, evidence concerning Brown's past medical history during his service in the Navy was brought up. And it turns out that Brown had a long history of mental health issues. Brown had his first psychotic episode in the year 2000 when he was hospitalized for schizophrenia. He was in the Navy at the time and he was prescribed a combination of two antipsychotic drugs. Now, I'm going to butcher these. Please don't at me. I am trying my best. The two drugs were chlorpromazine and the second drug was olanzapine. Now, he was eventually discharged from the hospital and deemed mentally stable and no medications were prescribed to him to take after his release. He stayed on active duty for another 11 years after this initial incident with no other incidents, and he retired in 2011. Sometime between 2011 and 2012, Brown's sister petitioned for an involuntary psychiatric evaluation because Brown was exhibiting paranoid behavior. In January of 2018, the Bureau of Prisons clinician provided the results of the mental health evaluation. The clinician gave Brown a diagnosis of schizophrenia with catatonia and paranoid and disorganized features. The evaluator also noted that Brown consistently refused psychiatric medication. The court determined that he was incompetent to stand trial and ordered that he be remanded to an appropriate Bureau of Prisons facility. Brown was then moved to Butner Federal Prison Camp in Bahama, North Carolina for further evaluation for no more than four months. While there, on May 25th, Brown wiggled out of his chain restraint and bowed up like he was going to hit the guard. They ordered him to go back to the restraint, but Brown was like, nope, make me. At that point, they gave him a single dose of the antipsychotic medication, Haloperidol, that thankfully calmed him down. A few days later, on May 31st, the defense filed an emergency motion to keep doctors at Butner from involuntarily medicating Brown. Four days later, on June 4th, the court denied the motion, but independently ordered a stay on any medication being forcibly administered to Brown until the court, of course, could determine if it was appropriate or not. A hearing was held on June 21st, 2018, that determined that it was absolutely necessary to keep Brown medicated involuntarily to keep him from harming himself or others. He was categorized as a danger to himself or others and categorized as, quote, gravely disabled, end quote, and the medication was again forcibly given to Brown. In July, a competency evaluation was performed and again, it was determined that Brown was incompetent to stand trial. The judge ordered another four months of medication. In September, they started all over with another four months, except this time they felt there was a substantial probability that he could regain competence with treatment. And he was even transferred from the most secure area of the prison to a less restrictive, semi-locked area. In October, he was allowed to spend time outside of his cell. And in some of the common areas, although it was noted, he still had some, I don't know, like residual psychotic symptomology. He also had auditory hallucinations and paranoia. But the progress he had made ended up being considered small. And in November, the court ruled that he should remain in the medical facility at Butner and be reconsidered in another four months, which would be in February of 2019. Around the time the courts were starting to determine Brown's competency to stand trial, a family in Chesapeake, Virginia, came forward and gave an interview to 13 News Now. Oh boy, what could it be? Back in the 1990s, Nakia Moore's mother worked at a collections agency and Brown was employed as a security guard there. She said her mom was like the big mama to everyone at her work, but especially to Brown. In 2016, Nakia's mom allowed Brown to move into the family home after finding out that he was homeless. 
When Brown was with them, he was super helpful with home improvement projects. He helped them organize the family's taxi business, and he even attended church with them on Sundays. But Nakia said she noticed some odd behavior from Brown. He was obsessed with the nutritional value of food. He talked about several conspiracy theories about the government, and he frequented these motels for dates. He also crossed the line with her asking her a crude question that wasn't at all appropriate and doesn't need to be repeated here. She said that she got a negative vibe from people when they met or interacted with Brown. Now, when her brother Terrence, who is a merchant marine, came back from sea, he freaked the hell out and told his parents that Brown needed to get out. So with this information, it all just added to Brown's current diagnosis. The roller coaster of trying to determine if he could even stand trial continued through all of 2019. Then it all came to a head in December when two experts, one for the government and one for the defense, went toe to toe with their own preferred treatment that they felt would be the best way to help Brown get well enough to be tried for Ashanti's murder. And before I get there, I have to give you a little bit of a backstory. In 2003, a case was decided by the United States Supreme Court that established a series of four factors for district courts to use as a form of a framework to justify forcing an inmate to take antipsychotic medications. And the test is known as the cell ruling. In this case, all four factors in Brown's case were decided in favor of the government with the final ruling that Brown was not competent to comply with a court order to take medication or voluntarily agree to an individualized treatment plan, an ITP. The government's expert had proposed that Brown stay on the same treatment of haloperidol and olanzapine injections, with the ruling that the current therapy would continue. And listen, this process continued. It continued well into September of 2020 when the whole process was repeated again and the cell ruling remained in effect once again. So in September of 2020, that was the last time that Brown's case was visited. Today, he remains mentally unfit, incarcerated at Butner Federal Prison's mental ward, and the trial postponed indefinitely. In all this time, Ashanti's parents, Mel Tony and Brandy, they continued to mourn the loss of their daughter. In an interview with W.Y. Daily, Mel Tony said that he and his wife were comfortable with Ashanti working on base because they felt it was a safe place for her. Heartbreakingly, it wasn't as safe as they thought, though. Ashanti had told her parents that she wanted to work at the Blimpy on base because it would give her a chance to give back to the military community. She had suffered from a seizure disorder as a child and knew she could never join the military and serve like her parents did. When Mel Tony and Melanie learned that Brown was homeless, but was able to linger around and inside military installations, they wondered why base security didn't do something about getting him out. Mel Tony stated that Ashanti never mentioned Brown and how he was harassing her at the restaurant. But Mel Tony and Brandy, they had taught Ashanti to deal with life's challenges on her own and only to come to them if her problem seemed too big. Sadly, Ashanti never saw Brown as a problem that was too big, and it cost her dearly. When all of this is going down, Ashanti's parents weren't the kind of people to just sit idly by and not bring something positive out of this tragedy. The first thing they did was establish the Ashanti Foundation, and they created a scholarship program in her name. One of the hardest things they had to face when Ashanti first went missing was that there was no national alert that Ashanti qualified for. She was 19 years old, so she was too old for an Amber Alert that's only for endangered children up to the age of 17. And she was too young for a Silver Alert, which is for missing and endangered seniors ages 65 and up. There was just no way to get the word out quickly that Ashanti was missing. You know how you see amber and silver alerts on traffic boards on the roads. They send cell phone pop up alerts. But in this case, there was none of that. There was no traffic board. There were no cell phone pop up alerts. Nothing, 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 nothing. So Ashanti's parents pushed for legislation 
to change that and to make an alert system for people over the age of 17, missing adults with special needs or circumstances and missing adults who are clearly endangered or have been involuntarily abducted or kidnapped. On December 31st, 2018, the Ashanti Alert Act of 2018 was signed into law. It authorizes the U.S. Attorney General to establish a national communications network to enable and help facilitate regional and local search efforts for missing individuals who fall outside the scope of amber and silver alerts. As of today, it is a law, but it lacks the funding needed to establish the infrastructure to implement. Two Virginia senators and one from Connecticut formally requested funding in September of 2021 to try to get the ball rolling with these Ashanti alerts. And you're probably wondering, what happened to Brown? Well, Eric Brian Brown remains incarcerated at the Butner Federal Prison. He continues to be reevaluated every four months until such a time when he can be deemed competent to stand trial. True Crime Army, this case was recommended to me during a conference. And wow, what a case. I learned so much. I had never told the story of someone found incompetent to stand trial. I also didn't realize how vulnerable adults from ages 18 to 64 were without an alert system. Of course, I'm assuming that the standards to qualify for an Ashanti alert when it does happen, they're probably going to be pretty rigid as adults voluntarily go ghost mode all the time. But in Ashanti's case, it was clear something happened to her while on a military installation. And that's the scariest part. Make sure that you follow me on social media where I will keep everyone posted and updated on this case. Follow me on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast and on TikTok at Military Margot with a T at the end, where I feature about one to two cases a week that I haven't covered on the podcast. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with all of my boot camp and higher fan club members. Shout out to this month's newest executive producer, Jenny. Thank you so much, Jenny, for joining the crew. Executive producers for the show, in addition to Jenny, are Falcon 13, Nicole, Alicia, Tina, and Ryan. The newest associate producers this month are Victoria, Kristen, Kimberly, and Crystal. And the newest assistant producers are Brandy, Sarah, and Alvin. And I just want to give a special shout out to all of my newest supporters. We have Aneda, Karina, Shelly, Lynette, Mindy, Kelly, Maggie, Kennedy, Brandon, Xiomara, Joseph, and Melinda. The music on this show was created by TyOps. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shh, let's work on our podcast.